This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 12th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss what we'll be looking for in the upcoming revenue forecast, governor's budget, and 10-year plan due out later this week. Second, we discuss two recent op-eds in the ADN that argue Alaska should be going big on spending, and here's the silent part, at the expense of middle and lower income Alaska families. And third, we examine what happens to education spending if oil prices go down. And now, let's join Michael. Let's take a look at number one. Number one today, a look at the governor's revenue forecast and some prognostication on what you think his budget is going to look like, which is due on Friday. So we won't even have a chance to analyze this before the new year. So give us uh, give us your thoughts, Brad. Take it away. Well, the uh, as a friend said, it's that tradition where the governor's budget is due, or the governor or the revenue forecast is due, and the and the oil markets have gone haywire. Uh, that seems to be a uh, what we the cycle we've gotten into the last few years. In the spring, the markets have gone haywire on the on the upside uh, with prices increasing. Uh, this year, the markets have gone haywire on the downside with prices uh, prices decreasing. Let's look, let's do the revenue forecast first. The revenue forecast is going to be uh, is going to be tough. Um, it, it's going to show that uh, that revenues are uh, down a lot. Uh, for uh, uh, the current fiscal year, FY23, and they're going to show that they're down a lot for next year, FY24, the, 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 the year that the legislature is going to be working on the budget they're going to be working on when they go back to Juneau. And it's going to show that the subsequent years are down from, uh, from the prior revenue forecast. This year's budget, uh, some will recall, is based upon uh, $101. That was the price that they used uh, at the time. They set the budget up to work in tiers uh, at 102 do- above $102. Money went to uh, the Constitutional Budget Reserve uh, and above a certain level above that, it went to the directly to the permanent fund. Below $102, uh, down to $87, uh, the money in that uh, tranche of revenues goes to uh, forward funding for K through 12, below $87. Uh, they've run through the SBR. Uh, and uh, and they're into the in the constitutional budget reserve. The current forecast as of this morning, taking into account the fu- what we, the prices we've sp- experienced thus far, and taking into account the futures market, is for an annual average of eighty six dollars. So below the eighty seven dollars. Uh, this is using the same format, the same running ten day average futures market average that the that the uh, the revenue uh, forecast is based on. So we're around, we're right around that eighty-seven dollar mark, maybe a little bit uh, below it, uh, in a in a situation where when the legislature comes in, they're going to have to dig into the CBR uh, a little bit to uh, to balance the uh, FY twenty three budget. There's going to be no, based upon this forecast, there's going to be no uh, forward funding for uh, K through twelve. The real tough part. Is going to be FY24, uh, the budget that the legislature is going to have to deal with uh, or is going to deal with this coming uh, legislative session. The spring revenue forecast forecasts that price, uh, the price for FY24, as an average of $90. The futures market is telling us this morning that that average for, uh, for FY24 is $78, uh, $12 below uh, 
uh, the FY, uh, the FY, or the, the spring revenue forecast projection for uh, FY24. So revenues are way down uh, as well for FY24. And then for the remainder of the 10 year uh, outlook that the administration has, prices sort of get back to normal by FY29. F, well, get back to the, the projection that was included in the spring revenue forecast by FY29 and FY30, but between FY24 and FY29, uh, prices stay significant below the, significantly below what was forecast in the uh, in the uh, futures um, or in the in the spring revenue forecast. So we're going to see we're going to see a, a revenue forecast that's going to have significantly lower uh, uh, prices. There's one other aspect of the revenue forecast that I'm really going to be uh, focused on as well, and that's the production forecast. Uh, the the production forecast for FY23 uh, uh, included in the spring revenue forecast was 502,000 uh, 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 barrels a day uh, and, and increasing from there over over future years, slightly in FY24 and then subsequent years sort of sort of went up from there. We have we haven't touched F, we haven't touched 500,000 uh, uh, barrels a day yet on a monthly average uh, yet this year. And we're fairly deep into the year. We're approaching 50% halfway through the year. Um, and I think, I think it, it, it's fairly clear that the production forecast is, is a little high. So these prices that we talk about, the $87 as being the break point between forward funding K through 12 and, and, and you know, not being able to forward fund K through 12, these price levels are all based upon production levels of 502 thousand barrels a day. If we don't get to 502,000 barrels a day, then these price levels are, are a little bit out of kilter. The price levels would need to be higher. If the production's lower, the price levels would need to be higher. And the fact that we're short running the price levels takes on takes on more significance. So there, there, we're, we're about to have a, a reckoning uh, on, both, uh, on both price levels and on production levels, I think, that are going to show that the FY23 budget and I'm going to guess the FY24 budget also on production levels are going to be are going to be lower, and uh, and so we're going to have lower revenues. Brad, uh, shouldn't we have learned our lesson on this? I mean, this reminds me again of the um, of the uh, Sean Parnell years where we were building budgets based on outdated pricing. I mean, it, he was basing a budget on $115 oil, and we were down somewhere in the 80s on oil. Uh, and now they're doing the same thing, only on production value. So, I mean, it seems like all these numbers mean nothing because, uh, you know, you could have barrel at $90, uh, the, 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 the numbers for the price could match. But if you've got production at 15% over anything that we've been doing, you still paint yourself into a corner. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. I, I wrote a column, one of my columns for the Alaska Landmine a few weeks ago. Uh, was how to address that. I mean, it was. I think the headline had something to do about something to do with OPEC, uh, and and the fact that you know we're sort of the tail on the OPEC dog. We get wagged around by whatever OPEC's doing on prices, and it was it was an analysis of what we could do to to help solve that. And one of the things that people have talked about and that I talk about in that in that column is using the ten year average of oil prices. Um, oil prices go up, oil prices go down, but if you use the ten year average. Uh, the trailing 10-year average uh, or the trailing five-year average. Well, that'd be a little bit more volatile, uh, but use a trailing average like we do, for example, with the, with the permanent fund dividend. We use the trailing five-year average of earnings from the, from the permanent fund or uh, the, uh, the POMV approach. We use the trailing five-year uh, uh, average value of the permanent fund in, in calculating the uh, POMV. So, in other major areas of fiscal policy, we're using a trailing average so that we don't get caught up in these in these spikes that go up and down like we are with oil. We've never done that with oil. We've always used the next year's forecast uh, uh, done by the Department of Revenue as adjusted in the spring revenue forecast. We've always used the next year forecast. And so we've had these these up and downs and variations. If um, if we if we flipped oil fiscal policy. To the same way we do uh, uh, permanent fund earnings fiscal policy for the PFD or for the POMV, if we flipped oil policy to do that, to do a trailing average, we'd have a, a more stable, wouldn't be perfectly stable, but we'd have a more stable approach. I've urged uh, the administration uh, to do that. Uh, I don't anticipate seeing it 
uh, in this uh, in this revenue forecast. But but as people dig into fiscal policy uh, in this coming session, I think it's something that they that they really ought to take up because the, these oil spikes and these oil uh, uh, drops it just you know just whip us around. Last year we saw we had an oil spike, oil price spike, oil revenue spike, and we spent it all. <laughs> I mean, we we do we just you know went crazy spending it all. And this year we're going to have an oil price low, and it's going to be a tough budget. I mean, the, the governor's budget is going to be predicated on on much lower revenues. Um, I suspect what we're going to see in the budget is a bunch of tricks to make you, to make the optics look better. He doesn't want right. to, he doesn't want doesn't want to propose deep cuts uh, that got him into trouble in uh, in 2019 that had such a reaction in twenty nineteen. He doesn't want to propose those. This governor is not going to propose new revenues or, or substitute revenues for PFD cuts. He doesn't want to propose deep PFD cuts. He wants to keep to POMB 50-50 if he can. So the way you do that is you start playing with inflation. You start playing with you know growth factors. You start playing with a bunch of things to make the optics look better going forward uh, than, than what they really are. Um, I, I think I think my first column after this new budget is going to be come in, coming out is here's the tricks that uh, that the that the governor is included in the tenure included in the budget and the ten year plan to to make the optics look better when it really isn't. But you're exactly right, Michael. We need to we need to do better on how we calculate oil revenues, and I think adopting an approach that's similar to what we do with with the permanent fund, the trailing average approach we use with the permanent fund perm, uh, permanent fund dividend with the POMB uh, would put us in a lot uh, uh, a lot less volatile situation. Well, that's number four of the charter of changes is the one that we talk about the least, and that is changing the budget, changing how we factor the budget. It shouldn't be this lawn dart with uh, revenue projections that are pie in the sky. You know, I mean, I've often said, why not? Uh, you know, why couldn't we build it on a five-year rolling average of past revenues and start from there kind of thing? Um, and, you know, this trickery is, you know, what we call voodoo economics. That's what the you know, this kind of sorcerous shell game that we see in these budgets. It just, it blows my mind that we're still here. We're still here. 15 years later, we've been talking about the accounting tricks that they pull in this kind of stuff. And it's just astonishing. We keep falling for it. And we keep going for it. And I, I, for one, am quite sick of it, quite honestly. Quickly, Brad. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, it, you know, it sort of depends. Again, it goes back to this, this discussion we've had before. Does governor, does Dunleavy want to be a, a, a does he want to worry about his legacy in this in this next four years or does he want to worry about you know running for senate in four years or six years depending upon how many how people feel about dan sullivan and in, in that in that time frame um and if he wants to be a legacy governor i think one of the things he could do and he can do this through the department of revenue i mean there's no there's no statute that says how you calculate oil revenues um, and, and that you have to abide by you. It, it's really up to the governor originally and how he proposes to calculate oil revenues in his budget. If he wants to be a legacy governor to leave a legacy like Jay Hammond in his second term, uh, then I think addressing that revenue issue, how we calculate revenues for budget purposes could be one of the things he would do to, to help leave a legacy. I just cannot help the feeling, Brad, of it's like Groundhog Day. You know, again, talking about the voodoo economics and the and the trickery and the shell games and all that kind of stuff. I mean, here we are. It's Monday yet again. Right. It just seems like we don't learn from this. I mean, this is the Tony Knowles. Um, you know, we had an increase to the budget, but, uh, you know, but I cut three quarters of the increase. So I cut the budget. No, the, the budget still went up by a quarter. You know, it still went up by X number of dollars, but I cut the budget. No, you cut the increase to the, this is the, again, I feel like it's just, my head is whipping back and forth from all the, uh, the whiplash of, uh, of this, this reoccurring nightmare of Groundhog Day. Are we ever going to learn? I mean, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, how do we, how do the politicians keep getting away with this? Well, the problem, the, the challenge is they want the upside. They, when oil prices come up, uh, they want the benefit of that. They want to be able to you know, spend on the things that uh, that make their constituents happy. So they don't want to give up the upside and the and the cost of that is that we continually get the downside when when oil prices when oil prices come back down, um, putting us on a stable and and so that destroys spending, right? When we when we have an upside and they spend, they and they create new programs, they raise expectations uh, that that we're going to be doing all these all these things on a on a continual basis. 
And then when we have the downsides, then, you know, they get, we get constituents crying and screaming about the fact that they're cutting their programs because we no longer have the revenues to support them. It would be great if we had a steady stream, if we had a predictable steady stream of revenues that didn't give us, you know, didn't give us, you know, huge downsides. It also wouldn't give us huge upsides. And, and it would be great if we did that. And as I say, if Governor Dunleavy wants to be a legacy governor, if he wants to, if he wants to create a legacy similar to what Jay Hammond did in his second term to leave behind for future generations to, to admire, then these are things that he can correct. He could correct his, his Department of Revenue, um, his OMB could correct uh, the use of you know, annual forecast revenues, oil revenues, as the basis for budgeting. They could go back and say, no, we're going to budget. We're, we're going to budget based upon 10 years. Now, the legislature could potentially change that. They could say, no, we're, we're still going to budget on forecasts. But the governor could start off with a budget based upon a trailing average for oil. He could set the tone for, for, for doing that. I don't expect it in this in this uh, in this in this uh, cycle uh, budget round. Uh, we've just got ourselves trapped in 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 this cycle of of ups and downs because they want to take advantage of the ups. Um, I, I don't know if we ever get out of uh, out of it. But this governor has an opportunity as a second as, as a governor with a second term. He has an opportunity to develop a legacy and and uh, and and make Alaska better going forward. Uh, Brad, give us a quick sneak peek at number two before we go to break here quickly. So both uh, Charles Wolforth in, uh, in columns in the ADN and the ADN have talked about uh, all the things we could do to make Alaska better. Um, and uh, and they have there's a common theme to them, and, and we're going to talk about those common themes. Uh, they aren't preserving the PFD, by the way, but we're going to talk about those common <laughs> themes. Big, this is my shocked face, Brad, my absolute <laughs> shocked face that they're not talking about preserving the PFD. Okay, we're continuing with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, on to number two, which is another question, I guess, of who pays. And we've got uh, we've got more discussion on that. The opinion makers, including the ADN editorial board and Charles Wolferth, who has written extensively on government spending and taking your PFD, uh, both had sounded off on this. Uh, Brad, what uh, what say you? Well, the titles, the titles of both these pieces tell you what's going on. Wolfers is a three-part series worth reading, uh, uh, even if you, you know, you just take your blood pressure medicine before you start reading, but, but worth reading. Uh, the title of that is to how, how to Turn Alaska Around. And then the ADN over the weekend, and its weekend editorial, uh, wrote an editorial that's titled, uh, What Happened to Alaska's Swing for the Fences Spirit? And basically, it's a it's a long uh, a, a long uh, uh, form of uh, we got to we got to dream of big plans. We got to do big things. We got to you know we got to become the the people that uh, that have these high aspirations. Again. Not a not a gas pipeline. They're clear on that. Not a gas pipeline, but we got to have big aspirations again. Um, and they're both they're both really going to the same thing. Alaska's in and the economists tell us Alaska's in an economic doldrum economic low point, oil prices are at a low point. Uh, how do you get Alaska out of this? Basically, Wolferth is saying you do it through education. You do it through additional education spending, additional education programs, pre-K education programs, higher ed education programs. And you turn Alaska into a center of education excellence is basically his point. The ADN is less specific, but nevertheless talk a lot about uh, uh, big things, just doing big programs. We've got to come up with some big program to, uh, to pull Alaska out of, uh, out of, out of the doldrums. Both of them, uh, really try to slide over the question of who pays for these programs. Wolferth at least, uh, talks, he does talk about PFD cuts. He at least mentions the words taxes. Now I'm going to come back to that in a second. It's not, it's not a legitimate mention, but he at least mentions the word taxes. The ADN in a 600 word plus uh, editorial doesn't mention the word tax once. And, and, and the, only, the only other source of revenue that's out there is PFD cuts. So basically what they're talking about is financing these big things on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through, uh, through PFD cuts. No mention at all. Of, of a more equitable revenue base to do what they want to do because they know that if they mentioned that the top 20% would, you know, pile on and say, no, we're not going to do that. So they want to do these things. 
they don't want the top 20 percent to push back so all so all they all they leave out there is PDF, pfd cuts now wolferth mentions both pfd cuts and taxes but but he talks about it in a way where pfd cuts come first and taxes are sort of on top of that and and if we if we allow a large part of this of the funding of the who pays funding to be through pfd cuts we'll never we'll see marginal taxes itty bitty taxes so we can say yes we have some taxes that are contributing toward it but the bulk of the of the revenue will come from pfd cuts will come from middle and lower income alaska families it won't be spread equitably across all Alaska families will will be shoving the burden off on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. So both of the, both of them are essentially saying we need to do big things, we need to spend more money, we need to we need to work our way, we, government needs to get us out of these economic doldrums by leading the way and spending um, uh, spending more money. Uh, but we don't want to we don't want to pay for it by uh, by you know having equitable taxes. We don't want to pay for it by all Alaska families contributing to it. We want to focus the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families uh, through PFD cuts. And it's just, I mean, that's, it, it's, it's the way that we've seen the ADN editorial pages uh, go for now a, a prolonged period of time. They don't, they have big plans. They have big hopes, big aspirations, big ideas about how government can spend us out of, out of whatever uh, economic doldrums we're in. But in terms of who pays, it gets a, a minor, minor space in the discussion. And, and then it's PFD cuts. Uh, it's, uh, it's doing it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Not, uh, not an equitable way to uh, share the costs across, across all Alaska families. And indeed, using PFD cuts means we don't tap non-residents to help pay for, uh, as every, right. other, state, as every right. other state in the United States does, we don't tap non-residents to help pay for uh, to help pay for the costs. Um, I, I think it's interesting, this editorial from the ADN, what happened to Alaska's swing for the spirit, uh, swing for the fences spirit. I always love that because it's like this effusive, expansive, you know, we're going to swing for the fences. We're going to spend everything we got and then some to make it happen, betting on the if come. And that's really the whole flavor of this article. This whole opinion piece is all flavored with, we should just spend everything we got and then some, and that'll make it all better. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but that's really kind of what it all comes down to. You know, it's, it's, we've got, we're seeing the Hickel uh, 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 Hammond divide show up again, just over and over and over again. This is the whole Hickel, build it and they will come build, build a big state, do big things, take state money and, and, and lead the way and, and good things will come. It's both Wolfers doing that with his, with his, you know, lead on education, pre-K, K through 12, more education in K through 12, more university spending, build education and they will come. The ADN is less specific, just build something um, and they, and they will come. Both of it though, using both of it based on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. Hammond, Hammond said, if you want to build it, go ahead and build it, but at least share the costs equitably, use taxes to, to make sure that all Alaska families pay equitably toward toward the cost. Hickel said, build it and use PFDs. I mean, use use permanent fund earnings, use uh, use whatever source you, you know you can you can grab onto uh, and build it. So we're seeing we're seeing the whole the, the old Hickel Hammond divide again on the editorial pages with the with with both Wolferth and the ADN editorial sta uh, editorial staff both clearly landing on the Hickel side of just build it big. Uh, and and use uh, PFD cuts to build it. We're under five minutes now, so let's move on to number three, which is the <clears throat> correlation or causality, I guess, correlation between oil price, uh, oil prices, and education spend. We know that's going to be a top tier. That's going to be a top tier platform. That's what they're going to be talking about. Is uh, is you know is uh, education costs and education spending. Uh, that and uh, that and uh, defined benefits. Those are going to be probably two of the big hits this year. Uh, give me the correlation between what oil prices and education spending. Well, here's here, here's what it's going to come down to. Uh, there is going to be a big push for education spending. It's going to be fueled by both the Anchorage school cut, uh, school closure uh, uh, discussion, as well as as well as education spending uh, problems elsewhere in the state. They're, they've got it in Fairbanks. They've got it in Juneau. They've got it out in the bush. So there's going to be a huge push for spending 
The Dunleavy administration, I suspect, is going to say we don't have the money to do it. Uh, we, if you look, oil prices are down. We've got to be. We've got to go back into a constrained mode. We don't have the money to to, to spend on these things. We're going to have to live within the revenues. Live within the means that uh, that we've developed. Uh, we can't afford to to have to have additional things. And 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 what's going to the pushback that's going to come from the education community and those who want to increase spending is going to be, well, don't worry about oil prices. Just take it out of permanent fund earnings. We've got these rock solid permanent fund earnings, three plus billion dollars that are coming out in permanent fund earnings. Just spend it, just take it from that. And basically it's PFD cut. Let, let, let middle and lower, let's have middle and lower income Alaska families fund these increased education spending, fund increased education spending by uh, taking it out of, uh, taking it out of the PFD for permanent fund earnings and taking it out of the PFD. So that's going to be the debate. The Dunleavy administration is going to say, we don't have the money to do it. Uh, we don't have oil prices aren't up. We don't have excess revenues. We, we're, we're going to have to live in a constrained environment. Education community is going to say, we do have the money to do it. Look at the permanent fund earnings. Let's, let's, let's use the permanent fund earnings for that. Let's take the Wolforth column. Let's take the, the ADN column and let's go big uh, in terms of, in terms of spending out of uh, permanent fund earnings. And that's going to be, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be the debate. The pushback that I'm going to have uh, and that I hope others is, is if you want to spend it, fine, go ahead and spend it. But make sure that it comes, that, that the costs are coming equitably from all Alaska families and, and get the top 20% engaged in this discussion as well. Otherwise, the top 20% is going to sit there and go, we don't care. I mean, yeah, if you want to spend it, go ahead and spend it. Well, it doesn't <clears throat> us. Take it out but of you're not, fund earnings. But again, you're not advocating for spending on these programs to these big projects like the Hickle, like projects to build it and they will come. I mean, that's not your, you're, you're being devil's advocate here. You're saying if you're going to spend it, it should come from everybody, but you're not advocating for, I just want to be clear to people because somebody in the chat room just said, oh, now Brad's advocating for all these programs. That's not what you're saying, but if they are going to build it, if they are going to spend it, it should come from everybody is what you're saying, right? I just absolutely. want to be clear. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely right. The, 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 the problem that we have, and we've discussed it on the program repeatedly before, the problem we have is the top 20% doesn't get engaged in these discussions. We need yeah. to have them engaged. I think the problem here is that some people take you very literally when you say things like, well, sure, but at least make sure it comes from the whole crowd instead of everything else. But, uh, you know, that's the that's the thing. Um, you're not saying that it should be used for big public projects. You're not saying that if they did tax everybody, it should be used for big stuff and spending and building it so they will come kind of thing. Here, here's the if we if everybody has to pay, if the top 20 percent has to pay, we won't spend it. The, the key is getting the top 20 percent engaged, the wealthiest Alaskans engaged in this debate. If we say, yeah, spend it, but the top 20% have to pay for it, all of a sudden the top 20% will say, will say, whoa, we have to pay for this? We're not going to do that. No, 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 no. Stop the spending. As long as they don't have to pay for it, as long as we use PFD cuts, they're they're off to the side. They, they're, they're agnostic about it. They say, eh, spend it if you want. Don't spend it if you want. We don't care because we don't have to pay for it. The, 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 the key to stopping this, the key to getting control of, of spending, the key to restraining spending is getting the top 20%, the donor class, those who gave the money to the political candidates, getting them involved in the debate, making them see that they would have to pay as well uh, for, uh, for, for, uh, for spending. So uh, to me, the spending, we always go wrong on the spending day. Should we spend it? Shouldn't we spend it? Should it be, you know, is it, is it worth, is it worth spending? We don't have everybody engaged in that debate. We don't have the top 20, because we're using PFD cuts, we don't have the top 20% engaged in that debate. Once we get them engaged in the debate, spending will stop. They will, they will make sure that spending stops. As long as they're not engaged in the debate, spending will continue to grow because they'll be off to the sidelines and other, the, the special interests will be pushing for, uh, for increased spending. So the key to but me, the key to me is getting no, them just, involved in the discussion. I was just, let's play devil's advocate. And Donna plays devil's advocate in the chat room when she says, you know, California pays a top 20% for government largesse. I mean, so we're seeing, I mean, this has always been my challenge with new taxes is that they're spending every dollar inside. Now, if we give them more dollars, 
they'll just spend that as well. Michael, they've got all the dollars they need. They'll just take more and more PFD cuts. This isn't a question of them not having dollars. They have the dollars. They have the dollars in the in the permanent fund earnings earnings uh, that that are coming out. They're taking more. They're taking more for government out of permanent fund earnings uh, out of PFD cuts than they ever would out of out of uh, taxes. If we had taxes instead of permanent fund dividend cuts, we would have much lower spending levels because the tax levels they'd have to go to would be huge. Um, so it's it's not that they don't have the money. They do have the money. And we're going to see at this session when people say, you do have the money for K through 12 spending. You do have the money for pre-K. It's all sitting. It's right there in the earnings. All we have to do is reduce uh, PFDs, reduce free money going to Alaska citizens. Uh, and you do have the money. That's the, the challenge isn't they don't have the money. The challenge is who has to pay the money. And as long as the top 20% can dodge paying paying a portion of the of the burden, they'll continue to spend it. Make the top 20% pay, make, make them use taxes, make them show the percent of everybody's income, everybody's income that they're taking through taxes, and we'll start having curbs uh, on spending. Commonwealth North, the Chambers of Commerce, all of a sudden, they won't be talking about K through 12 programs. They won't be talking about building the state up through additional spending on K through 12 or additional spending on university programs. They'll be talking about restraining spending because it results in taxes on them. As long as we don't have, as long as they don't have to pay for it, as long as we're using PFD cuts to do it, they're 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 going to continue to talk about. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we had increased K through 12? Wouldn't it be nice if we had larger university systems? Wouldn't it be nice if we had additional spending on on this or that? The key to the key the the key in Alaska to getting spending under control is getting the top twenty percent engaged in 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 restraining. Well, fingers crossed. I mean, at this point, I just don't see anything else. Let's uh, last uh, 90 seconds here. I'm going to go back to the formation of the uh, of the uh, majority in the House and, of course, the current majority in the Senate. Um, and I know we're waiting on the Eastman trial and the Armstrong trial. But uh, best case scenario, Brad, is divided is divided chambers. Is that what you is that what you say? What do you what do you think? Well, at this point, yeah, I think the best the best outcome would have been that the Republicans control the Senate. But uh, well, Republicans do control the Senate, except it's the wrong Republicans. Um, uh, I think the best outcome at this point is uh, is is divided government that the that the the Republican majority uh, in the in the House uh, uh, forms uh, forms the majority and uh, and you know acts acts as a restraint. Otherwise, it's going to be if we have bipartisan coalitions. Otherwise, it's going to be up to the governor to uh, to to try to exercise his veto pen as as we've seen in the past. Since 2019, uh, he's very, uh, very reticent to do that. So, yeah, I think I think the key here is to is to is to have a gridlock between the the House and the Senate, and uh, and to have uh, Republicans in control of the House. Well, that might give Dunleavy uh, at least the feeling a little bit more of control of being able to do it. Otherwise, he's going to be. Uh, I guess basically on the defensive the entire time, uh, moving backwards, and uh, you know, and of course with the round heels and all that, like you've talked about in the past, that's going to be problematic. Yep, yep, it is, it is. So it's yeah. So I think uh, help out of the house is going to be uh, is, is going to be critical to that. Uh, otherwise, we're going to end up spending more. as long as as long as the top twenty percent don't have to pay for it, we're going to we're going to end up spending more. <laughs> Okay, Brad. Well, you have your homework, my friend. You know what you're supposed to do next week. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a long, multiple pages of lists of things, right? I mean, that's going to be working on. Um, we'll, we'll, be, ta we'll, ta we'll talk about how we're going to do this between now and then. Oh, it'll be fun. We're going to we're gonna have a good time. That's all it's, uh, it's, all it's about. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board and joining us today. And I'm really looking forward to next week, okay? Michael, as always, thanks for having me, and I'll and I'll get in the Christmas spirit. I promise. Get in that Christmas. Quit the bah humbug, Brad. Jeez, man, get positive. All right. All right. Thank you, Brad Keithley. I appreciate it, my friend. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.